We are born of the blood, made men by the blood, undone by the blood. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. A friend. What's in a friend? It depends, I guess. One could say a friend is a shoulder to lean on. Others could say that it is but a vector for pain. One moment they're by your side, and the next, they're gone like whispers in the night. The latter may indeed be true, but regardless, I'm still left here. Alone. It is no secret that many of us turn to art in times of struggle. Oftentimes we seek unique treasures, perhaps the comfort of a reflective film, maybe the symmetry of a complex painting, or the pain accompanied by pieces of poetry. Regardless, we're all searching for the same thing, healing. I played two complete playthroughs of From Software's Bloodborne, a 2015 title that encompasses fast-paced combat in a Victorian, Lovecraftian setting. My first was simply to have a fun experience. The gameplay seemed fun and engaging, and I had read the countless praise that it had received. My second, however, was a different endeavor entirely. It was a Hail Mary attempted healing. I was in pain. I felt powerless. I felt useless. All of which made the aggressive nature of such a game appealing to me. But did it actually heal me? How? That's for us to find out, I guess. This blight ravages my thoughts. Every waking moment is haunted by a shadow I foolishly hoped to see. Why did they leave? Did I not provide the safe refuge I thought I did? Was I not of good company? Did they even love me? Yeah. Well, you've come to the right place. Yarnum is the home of blood ministration. You need only unravel its mystery. But first, you'll need a contract. The game itself opens with the player character seeking healing from Yarnum's infamous blood, known throughout the lands to treat ailments and provide power. However, this remedy infects those who use it in excess and transforms them into eldritch beasts. After signing a contract, the player is given a transfusion and connected to the hunter's dream, an ethereal plane of rest. Here, you meet Garman, an old man who founded the Hunters, a group of combatants that specialize in hunting beasts. This fellow seems like a kind old man. You're welcome to use whatever you find. Even the dog, should it. I'm just gonna ignore that. Let's just get back to Yarnum and get hunting. Walking through central Yarnum, one can't help but observe a deeply rich environment. One can imagine that prior to the bestial scourge, Yarnum was a beautiful and thriving society. Each winding street echoes the cries and coughing of the inhabitants seeking refuge while others roam the night to join the hunt. Despite participating in the hunt yourself, Yarnumites don't take kindly to your presence. So be it. A common reason for people to play games is to achieve a form of power fantasy, and who can blame them? The prospect of taking control and being the big guy on the block is an enticing offer, which is why when the game tells the player that the world is their prey and hands them a weapon and a firearm, they don't ask questions. And why should I? Each weapon is accompanied by a satisfying trick moveset and a variety of forms and transition attacks. On top of that, firearms hold a unique role in the combat system. Instead of having a big stick go boom framework, successful hunters will use sidearms strategically to parry enemies and create openings for visceral attacks. Everything about this game's sandbox is screaming at the player to push the envelope and set the pace within the fight. Aggression on every level is rewarded. 
This might genuinely be the most satisfying and rewarding weapon sandbox I have ever played in a video game. There is something primal about how it feels. Something bestial. Something right. If the world has only crumbled around you, why not engage in the festivities? Why offer comfort or safe haven to those who deprive you of such gestures? Perhaps madness is the answer. After slaughtering our way up Central Yarnum to the foot of Erden Chapel, one last obstacle stands in our way. Beasts all over the shop. You'll be one of them sooner or later. Father Gascoigne is an interesting figure. A man dedicated and devoted to the hunt. A man with a family. With an accomplished mastery of aggression. All devoted to the same bloodlust that I have instilled in me now. That is, until it all boils to the surface. In a cacophony of rage, Gascoigne transforms from a man into a beast. Forgetting all that came before. Uncontrollable. Undisciplined. Animalistic. I don't see betterment. I see suffering. And with my own aggression, I would only be bestowing him a kindness. Perhaps it's best if our bloodlust remains dormant. Stirring. Stirring ever still. A rage boils beneath the peach-hued surface of this being. A force that beckons my ear, but I cannot listen. Promises of resolve. Of peace. Of closure. Maniacal lies. All. Yet, I remain tempted. My instincts tell me to accept their proposals. To succumb to my own desires. A weakness inherited from my forefathers. The apple of Adam. The vices of man. Purification may be my only salvation. The Healing Church promises relief through blood ministration. However, said ministration is what led to Yarnum's mess in the first place. I must say that I have my doubts. But faith offers a tender reward, no doubt. The Cathedral Ward acts as both a labyrinth and a hub, having head-scratching paths and connecting to multiple zones. It is here that the player begins collecting items called Madman's Knowledge. When consumed, this item bestows the player insight, a secondary currency in the game. What could this be for? Religious institutions assert that they have knowledge of a narrow, moral passage that its congregants can commit to for a pious and rewarding life, abstaining from all instinctual desires, proselytizing the meek into the flock for the promise only a life of faith can provide. The Healing Church demands the critical practice of blood ministration. For what purpose? For healing? For ascension? It is the source of the scourge, after all. What could the clergy hope to gain or provide for this? We often associate piety with such figures. After all, they radiate hope, discipline, and connectedness. In an odd way, this can even be reflected in the level design for the Cathedral Ward. Its construction discourages straightforward progression with each main gate blocked off. The hunter must instead look for roundabout solutions in order to traverse the area. If the congregants are to seek answers from the cloth, why must the hurdles be so steep? In the church's state removed from the suffering of its own flock, perhaps it's become easier to remain pious. Yet, they are still subject to the same vices we are. Vicar Amelia, the highest ranking member of the Healing Church and the symbol of all things holy, could not hold out. 
It turns out that the Vickers become the most grotesque of all. Not even faith can withstand the corrosive instincts of the beast within. Faith alone could not ward off the vestiges of beast, let alone man. In the solitude of my disillusioned youth, there is no guiding light, no torch to guide me through the opaque night. Yet I seek answers still. To what end do I resolve this yearning? If faith could not divest me of such suffering, what can? Perhaps I am destined to a voyage devoid of a compass. Master Willem, I've come to bid you farewell. Oh, I know, I know. You think now to betray me. No, but you will never listen. I tell you, I will not forget our adage. We are born of the blood. Made men by the blood. Undone by the blood. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. I must take my leave. After touching the skull at the altar of the healing church, we are given insight of where to go next. Basking beneath the shadow of the healing church, the Forbidden Woods is said to house the Bergenworth College, an institution rumored to know the origins of the healing blood and ultimately the bestial scourge. However, we need to find it first. The woods are a massive and ever-spanning area with multiple townships, populations, and infrastructure all laying in ruins. Sunken pits, murky swamps, decaying souls wallowing in the pits of apathy. Backward beings all. However, we pave ahead. We need answers. But the path to learning always beckons more questions. don't suggest the presence of beasthood, rather sophistication, intention. Where are they from? What is their goal? This ordeal is becoming increasingly murky. We need more answers. Perhaps the intellect of academics could pave the road to enlightenment. We finally reach Bergenworth where we begin to truly understand what is going on. We are introduced to strange, otherworldly beings, creatures with countless eyes, Creatures that steal the power of insight. Creatures that appear to be kin to the stars themselves. What the hell is going on here? It is here that we finally locate Master Willem, the head of the Bergenworth College. Senile and likely driven mad, he can barely muster a gesture beckoning us to plunge into the lake below. This whole mystery is full of strange surprises. Well, fuck it. We ball. At the center of this otherworldly plane, we find Rom the Vacuous Spider, and we finally learn a piece of this increasingly complicated puzzle. The Healing Church and Bergenworth College were connected to beings called Great Ones, creatures that are beyond an average person's comprehension. The goal of these institutions was to ascend to a higher state of awareness. At first, they believed that the Pale Blood sourced from a Great One would help accomplish this. But of course, this only led to the Scourge. Next, Willem believed that humanity could ascend with the presence of more insight, the ability to see more things and the underlying truths that lay beneath our noses, attaching more eyes. Finally, the college attempted to ascend a human to the being of a Great One, Rom. Yet, Rom is merely the kin of Great Ones, 
Although Rom is titled as a spider, nothing about its design suggests a connection to spiders. It looks more like a caterpillar, if you ask me. You can draw your own conclusions from that. The hunter does what they must and puts down this twisted creation. But what are we left with? This doesn't fix anything. The scourge still continues. But off in the distance, who is that? Suddenly, our mission becomes clear. Silence the baby's cries. But this only beckons more questions. Who is this child? What responsibility do they hold in this whole damn mess? What salvation does any of this offer? Bloodlust is self-defeating, faith is utterly useless, and intellect only exacerbates the problem at hand. Is there even any answer in sight? The pursuit of answers will lead to clarity eventually, right? One need only follow the beaten path to lead them to prosperity. But sometimes, we run into nightmares. <laughs> oh, Amidala. Oh, Amidala. <laughs> Have mercy on the poor bastard. <laughs> <laughs> the implementation of Great Ones in the latter half of the game is where Bloodborne earns its Lovecraftian distinction. H.P. Lovecraft is basically the father of cosmic horror literature, responsible for creating such iconic menaces as Cthulhu. His works often focus on forces or creatures whose very nature lay beyond human comprehension. The Great Ones, and the general forces and locations at play, do just that. No one knows where these creatures came from. No one really knows what they're here for. Yet, they just sit there throughout Yahara Ghul content with watching you. At least they are just limited to one area, right? But this is where the true scope of these horrors really begin to come to light. Remember Insight? Insight acts as a level system of what the player can comprehend. As it gets higher, the player will begin to see more otherworldly things that were previously unnoticed. Revisiting Cathedral Ward will reveal the countless eyes that adorn the groundskeeper's lanterns. And this is no longer an eldritch horror. We are now in the midst of an existential, cosmic horror that would leave Lovecraft grinning ear to ear. After being harassed by a Great One yourself, you're transported to an ethereal plane. Essentially, these zones are nightmare realms. They are both physical and metaphysical manifestations that Great Ones hold domain over. At this moment, we are but a mere visitor. After fighting our way through horrifying swamps and hills of twisted tombstones, we finally come toe to toe with a Great One ourselves. He doesn't stand a chance. After finally coming back to the physical world, the player then makes their way through the hidden village Yahar Ghul. The village is the site where the School of Mensis, a branch of the Healing Church, attempted to create their own Great One. To accomplish this mission, they kidnapped countless townsfolk and assembled them into unspeakable, grotesque horrors. God, this is just disgusting. After going through a not-so-straightforward puzzle, the player can press forward to confront the School of Mensis but their most horrifying creation stands in our path. The One Reborn is basically the school's magnum opus, a collection of corpses strung together in a horrifying mass to become a Great One, or, at the very least, earn a Great One's favor. 
However, it's nothing more than a pathetic amalgamation of suffering. <sighs> Looks like we gotta at least put these poor bastards to rest. Now we can finally enter the school. It's time for these sick monsters to face the music and they're all dead. Just sitting in their debate seats. What happened here? Well, as per usual, we gotta touch some object to find out. The end game of the base Bloodborne experience is a rather perplexing sight. The Nightmare of Mensis is another shadow realm that is located within the mind of Mikalash, the leader of the school of Mensis. Full of grotesque dogs, spiders, and Thumerians, and whatever these are, the Nightmare of Mensis is a disturbing locale. On top of these enemies, you have the initial environmental hazard of frenzy buildup when exposed to light sourced at the top of the edifice. I wonder what that could be. After making our way up the tower, we encounter Mikalash, driven mad by the pursuit of ascension. Convinced that he is merely in a dream and unaware of his long-decayed corpse in Yahar Ghul, Mikalash believes he is on the cusp of communing with higher awareness. However, in order to figure out this mystery and end the hunt, we need to get past him. Okay, I was committed to not commenting on gameplay too much in this video, but I'll make an exception for this fucker. Mikalash is by far and away my least favorite boss fight in the entire game. Is it the worst? Debatably. I'd have to think it over and compare it to fights like the Witches of Hemwick and the Living Failures. But I have a particular bone to pick with this iron rot, big headed, annoying voice having asshole. You see, Mikalash is a gimmick boss. His entire fight is based around a new mechanic or framing device to bring some spice to the table. However, this gimmick makes the fight annoying as hell. The arena is now a series of hallways where you have to chase him and lead him into the actual fighting arena. He only has one move in phase one that you can avoid quite easily, so the first phase goes by in a blink. After you get him down to half health, he disappears and runs through a new series of hallways to be cornered again. However, in phase two, he has a spell that does devastating damage. It can basically one-shot you. The iframes are tight, so you find yourself actually pulling back a lot to make sure that you're properly positioned. The entire fight is just a frustrating run back. So yes, I will style on his corpse when I finish him off. Once Mikalash is taken out, we continue our way up the tower. However, I want to learn what was hitting me with the frenzy earlier. It's time to get a look for ourselves. The school of Mensis succeeded in gaining favor with a great one. It granted them eyes and ascension within the nightmare realm of Murgo's Loft. All it took was to make their brains stillborn and combined in a horrifying, almost grafted amalgamation of flesh. Talk about sick irony. We still aren't getting anything. Perhaps it's time that I resign from this search. It's clearly not within nature to find a vector of healing. Simply look at the failed attempts laid out before me. Gascoigne. The Healing Church. Bergenworth. All vain attempts to reach for ascension, pleasure, and release from the pain of this mortal plane. The School of Mensis can tell you that much. All of this, I am still alone. For what purpose? For what justification must the cosmos inflict such pain, such suffering onto one single being? Perhaps we are all simply destined to suffer in silence, in isolation. But we're not alone. We never were alone. Oh, Lawrence, Master Willem, somebody help me. Unshackle me, please. Anybody. I've had enough of this dream. The night blocks all sight. Oh. Somebody, please. Gehrman, the old man with questionable proclivities, has been suffering for far longer than we have. Although the hunter's dream is a place of rest for selected hunters, it also serves as a prison. Seeing that it's a dream realm, its existence must have been sanctioned by a great one. Gehrman, for all this time, has been here alone foolishly waiting for the shadow of his compatriots to return and release him from the dream. I am not the only one suffering. I never was. To think so is vanity. I'll find us a way out, Gehrman. I promise.
To end the nightmare, we need to silent the infant's cries. All we have to do is follow the sound to the top of the loft. Here, we briefly encounter the woman we saw earlier wrecked with grief. The blood on her stomach indicates that she lost a child. Perhaps it's this one? We summit the edifice to find the cries originating from a pram. As we approach, a ghastly figure descends from above to its defense. Nothing appears beneath its hood. This is a cosmic being. Perhaps this is the Great One that the School of Mensis made contact with. Regardless, it's time to silence the nightmare. It's finished. The nightmare is over. But our work is yet to be finished. Upon returning to the hunter's dream, we find the workshop in flames, having outlived its use. Standing before us is the doll. I haven't talked about this character up to this moment, but she served the player by offering upgrades and unyielding loyalty. Or is it loyalty? Why not call it love? Hunters have told me about the church, about the gods and their love. But do the gods love their creations? I am a doll created by you humans. Would you ever think to love me? Of course. I do love you. Isn't that how you've made me? Created by Gehrman, the doll inherently loves people. She loves the hunters, each and every one that has passed through the dream. She loves you. She has no reason other than the fact that she was designed to love. Although we don't share these same traits, nor do we reciprocate her feelings, perhaps there is something to be said here. We've gone through hell and back to find answers to healing. To find safe refuge from the world and the horrors that it inflicts, we barely spent time within the dream to stop, to listen, to love. Instead, we opted for the comfort of bloodlust, of faith, of madness. Ironically, we were more afraid of the refuge we had than the violence of Yarnum. To love, it's a scary thing. With our mission accomplished and the hunt ended, Gehrman waits for us beneath the tree to fulfill his role within the dream, to remove us from it. Good hunter, you've done well. The night is near its end. Now, I will show you mercy. You will die, forget the dream, and awake under the morning sun. Be freed from this terrible hunter's dream. No. I made a promise. I am willing to love. Goodbye, Gehrman. I hope the beams of sunlight are as blissful as you promised. But like all acts of love, there will be consequences.
Seeing the events that transpired, the Great One that holds domain over the Hunter's dream descends to examine the new tender to the dream. We know what this entails. Eternity and servitude to a cosmic being. A night that forever persists. A bevy of tombstones that will only see additional company. I accept this fate. I still carry the pain with me. But I can live with it. This may be cliche to say, but Bloodborne changed my life. It showed me the pitfalls of agony, the risks and backsliding of blind faith, the irredeemable links one can go to in search of answers, the safety that I cling to that never allows me to move on. It is hard to admit that the pain will never truly go away. Even if we want to, that means forgetting everything that caused it to begin with. I don't want to forget my friend. I don't want to forget the dream. Otherwise, they never existed. But I can love in their memory. So, the age-old question, did Bloodborne actually heal me? No. But it taught me how. Thank you for watching.